Okay, we're going to take a look at a particular exercise, 1.2.10. This is on page 35 of Basic Analysis 1, Introduction to Real Analysis. Show that if A and B are non-empty sets of non-negative real numbers, then the supremum of A times B is equal to the supremum of A times the supremum of B. As written in the textbook, they're also given to be sets which are bounded above, but if you include sort of knowledge that a set that is unbounded above has supremum infinity and you allow basic arithmetic with infinity, like infinity times a positive number is infinity, etc., then this still works, uh, including that zero times infinity will actually be equal to zero under this definition here. So you can go ahead and work with the extra assumption that these supremums are all real numbers, but it still remains true even in the extended reals of plus or minus infinity or specifically for these supremas because we're non-empty positive infinity. Okay, let's just review a, some basic set theory. This is not difficult stuff, it's really axiomatic, but it's a a type of set theory that we don't often do. Specifically, you can take the union of an arbitrary collection of sets. We're very used to taking the union of two sets or the union of three sets, or maybe the union of finitely many or even countably infinitely many different sets. But you can take the union of sets A sub T where T is indexed over a totally arbitrary set C. It doesn't even have to be a countable set. It doesn't even have to be a subset of the reals. It can be very, very weird. This is the axiom of union in zermelo frankel set theory. You can take the union of whatever collection of sets you want. All right, step one in the proof of the original theorem. If A is a non-empty set of non-negative real numbers and K is a non-negative constant, if you define the set KA to be all of the possible products of K times elements of the set A, then the supremum of KA is equal to K times the supremum of A. So if K is equal to zero, then the products K times little a will all be zero and the set K times A will simply be the set containing zero. This is a finite set, in fact, it's a singleton, so the supremum of that set is just the number zero, which happens to be k times the supremum of a because k is zero. Again, if you're working in the extended reals here, we're taking zero times infinity on the right to just be zero. But if super a is a finite real number, then definitely k times that will be zero. So let's assume k is positive. This is the more interesting case. Now for any x in the set k times a, x must be of the form k times some element of a. Now this element a must be less than or equal to the supremum of a, because sup a is an upper bound. Therefore, x which is equal to k times a is less than or equal to k times sup a. All we've done is multiplied this inequality by the positive number k, so we don't have to reverse the direction of inequality and remember that k times a is equal to x. In other words, every x in the set k times a is less than or equal to k times the sup of a. So k times sup of a is an upper bound on the set k times a. So we've shown that k times sup a is an upper bound of the set k times big A. What we need to do to show that that's actually the supremum is to show that it's the smallest possible upper bound. So pick a number which is smaller. Since k is positive, and remember not zero, we've already handled that case, we can divide by it and not reverse the inequality. So since z was less than k sup a, z over k is less than sup a. Well, now that we have a number less than the supremum of a, there must be an element of capital A that's bigger than z over k. Now we can multiply back through by k, and we found k times little a is bigger than z, but little a is an element of the set big A. Therefore, k times little a belongs to the set k times capital A. So we found an element of the set k times capital A bigger than z. In other words, z is not an upper bound on k times a. So this number is an upper bound of the set, but any number less than it isn't. Therefore, that must be the smallest possible upper bound. So this lemma is complete. If you multiply a set by a non-negative constant, the supremum gets multiplied by the same constant. Step two in our proof that that same kind of trick works when you don't just multiply by a constant, but by a whole set of values. Suppose that A is a non-empty set of non-negative real numbers, then its supremum is bigger than or equal to zero. Now this statement is pretty straightforward and it's usually given as a separate problem. I'm just including it here because I'm gonna wanna reference it. It's also not very hard to prove. The set A is non-empty, that's a given, so it has an element. Every element of A is non-negative, so that element is bigger than or equal to zero. Therefore, for any negative number, there must be an element of A which is bigger than it, because there's an element that's bigger than or equal to zero, which is bigger than Z. 
So any negative number can't be an upper bound of the set. Therefore, any negative number can't be the supremum. So the supremum can't be a negative number. Therefore, it's got to be bigger than or equal to zero. All right, step three, the set theory comes in. Suppose you have subsets of the real numbers. Each B sub T is a set of real numbers. How many sets do I have? They are indexed by some totally arbitrary collection set, capital C. Then if I take the union of all of these subsets and make a new set of real numbers, its supremum will be the same as if I just made a set out of the soups of the individual BTs and took a soup of the set of all the soups. So this is a soup of the grand union of the family of sets. This is a soup of just the collection of their soups, and the claim is that those two things are equal. Now, for convenience, I'm going to denote beta to represent this thing where I took the soups of the individual BTs, made a set out of all those suprema, and then took a supremum of that set. That is beta. So beta is the supremum of all of the individual supremums. Therefore, since beta is the supremum, of the supremums, beta is an upper bound of the supremums. Any individual supremum is less than or equal to beta. But observe, if you took any x in this grand union, x has to belong to one of the bts. Therefore, any x in the grand union is less than or equal to one of the supremums. Every x in the union belongs to one of these sets, so every x in the union is less than or equal to one of the supremums but all of the supremums are less than or equal to beta. Therefore, any x in the union must be less than or equal to beta. So this beta that we constructed is an upper bound on the grand union of all of your sets. Having shown that beta is an upper bound on this grand union, we need to show it's the smallest upper bound. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick any z, and rather than the way we did it before, picking z to be less than beta and showing it's not an upper bound, we're going to pick z and declare that it is an upper bound on the union and show that it must be bigger than or equal to beta. So let z be an upper bound of the union. So for any choice of bts and then any choice of an element of that set, since we're assuming z is an upper bound of this grand union, any element of any of the sets must be less than or equal to z. Now, for any particular fixed choice of t, this must hold for every x in the particular set b sub t. Because it holds in the grand union, if I just pick one of these bts, this inequality must hold there. So this choice of z must be an upper bound of this particular set bt. However, the supremum is the smallest possible upper bound of this particular set. Z is an upper bound of this particular set, so the supremum of that particular set is less than or equal to Z because the supremum is the smallest possible upper bound of that set. But this inequality now holds for every choice of T. So for every choice of T, this particular supremum is less than or equal to Z, meaning the z I picked must be an upper bound of the set of all supremums. Therefore, since z is an upper bound of this set, z is bigger than or equal to the soup, which is the smallest possible upper bound of that set. So having picked an arbitrary upper bound of the union, we showed that it's bigger than or equal to this number, but that's beta. So therefore, any upper bound of the union is bigger than or equal to beta, but beta is an upper bound of the union, so it must be the smallest possible one. Therefore, since soup soup bt, of all the possible individual supremums, take the supremum of that, that was what we called beta, it is an upper bound of the grand union, and any upper bound must be bigger than or equal to this, so beta is the smallest possible upper bound of the union, it is the supremum, and we're done, because beta is what we had defined as this number on the right, and we've now shown it's equal to the supremum of the union. So step three is done. The supremum of a union of sets is equal to the supremum of the set of soups of the individual sets that went into the union. Now we can put it all together. So we can prove the original claim. Let AB represent the set of all possible products of elements of A times elements of B, where A and B are specifically non-empty sets of non-negative numbers. Note, that this set of all possible products is actually equal to a union of a particular element of A 
times the entire set B. Remember that this we've already defined, this is the product, this constant times every possible element of this set, and now I union it over all possible elements of the set A. That will give me all possible products something in A times something in B. So by step two, since little a, for any particular choice, little a is just a number, and specifically a non-negative number, it can be factored out of this supremum. This is just a constant times a set where this constant is a non-negative. And in step two, we show that that constant factors out. So the supremum of little a times the set B is little a times the supremum of B. By step three, if I now union all of these sets together, the supremum of this grand union, which is just AB, is the supremum of the individual supremums which we just established was A times the soup of B. But now notice that here, soup B is a constant because capital B is a fixed set, it's not moving around. So since this is a constant, we can use step two and factor this non-negative constant out of this expression here. And what's the supremum of all the little a's? That's just soup A. That's the notation for the soup of the set A. So all together, by combining step two with step three with step two again, Step two, factor out the constant little a, but you do it for every choice of little a. So by step three, when you union all these together, you get this supremum, but now this is the constant soup b, factor it out by step two, and what's left is a supremum of elements of a, that's just soup a. So altogether, the soup of a b is equal to the soup of a times the soup of b. This proof is kind of remarkable in the set theory formalism that goes into it, but then at the end, it kind of elegantly fits. You just have this like factoring argument, factor one thing out, take a union, fact another thing out. And I would point out that the previous problem in the book having to do with the sum set A plus B can be proved with a triangle inequality and it's very direct, but you can also do an argument very much like this. Your step two would be a little different. Instead of arguing that a constant times a set that constant factors out, you would argue that a constant plus a set, that constant comes out as a sum. In other words, you would just replace step two to be the soup of little a plus b would be a plus the soup of b. And then you can do essentially the same argument to get the previous problem that the supremum of a set of sums is the sum of the two supremums and you don't have to invoke the triangle inequality. Not that the triangle inequality proof for that problem is bad, it's great. It's just kind of neat that this proof here essentially can be duplicated for both problems.